Hi, my name is Brittany. Thank you so much for checking out VBF Live. Head to our website, vbf.org, and while you're there, you can check out our latest message. Follow us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can donate to our ministry by going to our website and clicking the Tithe Here button, or you can mail us a check. If you have a cool story you would like to share with us, you can email it to us at share at vbf.org. Thank you so much for watching VBF Online. We hope you enjoy the message. Father God, we give you all the glory. Move in this place today. We need a touch from you. Hope be Darkness shaking, faith is rising. We know, we know, we know. Heart beat racing, living in your freedom. Joy overflowing. Yes, we know, we know, we know. Yes, we know, we know, we know. In our Turn around to somebody next to you, wave high, and let's continue worshiping. Are you past upon a weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Your shame's done all its deal. And you'll dance before some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Come on, church, we declare this. 
in this place and we continue to sing out for our breakthrough this morning we continue to sing for our healing this morning
Listen, I know it's hard work being a man. Look at me, I'm out here sweating. I'm in Texas, it's hotter than Satan's toenails. You know what I mean? But I'm so excited. At the end of August, gonna be at Big Bear Lake Men's Retreat. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Check it out, it's gonna be a revolution. Now, I'm not talking about Prince. I know a lot of y'all think about 1999. I get it, I get it. You know, we men, I get it. But I wanna challenge you to come out this year, the last end of the month of August, to Big Bear Lake for Men's Retreat. It's gonna be a revolution and it's all about taking back what the devil has stolen. You know, listen, I'm out here sweating. It's hard work. It's hard work being me, but I, I promise you that that week you'll come back a different husband, a different father, and you will be revolutionized in your mind as we take back what the enemy has stolen from us. Look forward to seeing you guys. Love you. That's a good lineup right there. You guys saw that? Uh, how are you guys doing? Good morning. You guys awake? Good to see you guys. Uh, if this is your first time, I want to say welcome. We do have a free gift just for you. It's in the foyer, so stop by and say hello. But like that video is saying, Friday, August 26th through Sunday, August 28th, that's for the boys. Okay? If, if you're debating on whether or not you want to go, just go. Not only do they have amazing food, not only is there going to be amazing fellowship, but we're going to dive in deep into knowing who God is in our lives. Amen? Amen? So let's, let's make it happen, guys. Uh, sign up. Uh, sign ups conclude August 14th. That's around the corner. So uh, do not delay. Also, we are uh, accepting back to school sign ups um, as of now. School materials, we do need help for stuff like that. Uh, but if you need help, if you're going, hey, I need some help, I have you know, some kids that need some new um, gear, we will be distributing them on August 14th. So you can sign up um, in the foyer to receive your voucher, and then we'll go ahead and help you guys out. And so for those of you guys who are willing to help us out, we need uh, notebooks, crayons, pens, pencils, journals, backpacks, and organizers. Um, we're going to have the yellow buses in the foyer. So if you come on Wednesdays and Sundays, you can purchase those things, drop them off so that therefore we can give them to a family um, in need. Where are all the ladies at? Hey. We have some for you. We have, uh, you're invited to a fiesta lunch as we talk about all that empower women's ministry. You guys like that one. Um, Sunday, August 21st at 1230 p.m. in Station 316. Uh, there is going to be lunch. It, it is going to be free. So RSVP at vbfwomen.com. Passionate Hearts is also starting up. It's a 10-month commitment, and Passionate Hearts is a curriculum based on uh, a support group for women 18 years and above recovering from wounds caused by child childhood uh, sexual abuse. So uh, if you know someone or if that is you, that's going to be Mondays at 6.30 p.m. right here at VBF. Again, you can sign up at vbfwomen.com. Bible Adventure has another August meeting and the space is still available. Okay, so if you want uh, some cheap child care, $10 per kid with dinner included. Okay, you do not want to miss out. It's going to be Friday, August 5th from 6 to 8 p.m., and that's going to be at the Northwest Campus. And then last but not leastly, Pastor Ron's coming back. Okay, we hope you enjoyed. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed our summer lineup of special guests uh, these several past uh, Sundays, but he will be coming back Sunday, August 7th. So uh, bring a friend, invite them. Uh, so he's coming back, bringing the fire, um, and we're excited. So tithes and offerings, you guys know the drill. We have these red baskets. We have a kiosk in the foyer, or you can go to our website at vbf.org or mail a check to 2300 East Brundage Lane. But with that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then get started with what God is doing in our lives this morning. Let's pray this. God, we thank you so much for bringing us here. God, we thank you so much for meeting us where we're at. 
Lord, I pray right now for every single person sitting in these chairs. Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us. God, we ask that you'd bless the giver. Lord, we ask that you'd bless the offering. And Lord, we ask that you'd bless those um, 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 who give the money. So we just thank you. We love you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, come on. Let's stand up together. We're going to have a little fun. I'm here to remind you about our Plus One offering. It's coming up on Sunday, August 7th, you guys. If you're not familiar with what our Plus One is, it's where we all bring an extra dollar as a community, and we use that extra dollar to go a long way and serve the community around us. It's always a cool, awesome experience, you guys, but don't forget, Sunday, August 7th, along with your normal offering, bring an extra dollar and watch what God can do with it. See you soon. We, uh, we have some special guest speakers today. We have Doug and Vicki Lohman. Uh, they've been a part of the VBF family for 44 years, uh, which is amazing because they're only 39 years old. So they're coming out here. They're Bakersfield born and raised, and now they're part of the Valley Vegas Church, and they're excited to share a message today that is going to help all of you and set some of you free. So please give a VBF warm welcome to Doug and Vicki Lohman. Well, good morning. We'll get Vicky out here in a second. Hello to you in person. Hello to you online as well. Welcome in. Always great to be back in hometown. Uh, I was here three weeks ago, if you remember, and I uh, started a, a series, actually, called How to Fight Your Battles. And we talked about the flesh. Uh, if you're here, you remember that. The, the flesh, that fallen part of us, that part of us that is just kind of drawn to sin. It, it's a sin sniffer. It just, it just you, your mind wants to do right for the Lord and your flesh just finds itself kind of doing the stuff that it shouldn't be doing. Well, today we're going to take a look at our second foe, uh, the battle that we must fight, and that is our mind. Our mind. Actually, our mind can either be a foe or a teammate. 
unlike our flesh, our mind can be turned in a good or in an evil direction. Let's compare our mind, for sake of illustration, to a hammer. Now, a hammer can be used to pound nails into lumber, producing a house that becomes a home for someone. But a hammer can also be used to strike someone, causing great bodily harm. So it can be good or bad. It depends on whose hand is wrapped around the hammer. Now, a mind that is under the control of the Holy Spirit is useful to us and beneficial to others. But a mind that is off the leash becomes like a rabid dog, not only tormenting the person whose mind is out of control, but it also affects those that it comes into contact with. The Bible says that we are responsible for our mind, our thoughts, and it gives us instruction on how to have a mind that is under the control of God. Romans 12, 2 talks about that. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to the, this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Very familiar passage. Not only should we present our bodies daily to the Lord for service, but we also need to offer our minds to him. Say, Lord, I want my mind to be yours today. I want you to have control over it. I don't want to give my mind over to anything other than you. Now, I want to be very clear from the outset that it is not a sin to have a mind that goes off track sometimes, okay? That, that's, that's not a sin. We can't control that. Uh, you'll hear my wife's story here in a second and, and just the struggles that she had. So, so we, we, that's not a sin, but we are responsible. Once that mind begins to wander, once it gets off track, we are responsible on getting it back in line with the Lord, okay? So it's not a sin to have thoughts of depression. It's not a sin to have thoughts of discouragement. It's not a sin to have fearful thoughts, anxious thoughts. You can't really control that when it, they come, but you have a lot to do with how far it goes on. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to fight against that? Or are you just going to just, just lay down and let those thoughts just dominate you? Now, it's torturous, and that's the place we're coming from today, from a place of understanding. It's torturous to have a mind that, that just is, is so sick in some senses, so given to fear, and so given to anxiety, and so given to depression. It's very frustrating. You that struggle with that, you know how frustrating that is. And so our hope today is that we want to share with you some uh, things that helped my wife and how she got through this. And this has the potential for some of you to be a day that will change the rest of your life. Th this can be that day, that defining day that it ends. It ends today or it begins today. So uh, that's our great hope. So with that in mind, uh, my wife is going to be very transparent, shares a uh, dark time in her life. Would you welcome my wife, Vicki Lohman? Thanks, babe. Well, good morning. It's so great to be with you. It's been a while, so it's good to be here. Well, let's just dig right in. As Doug said, I get to share with you my life's journey um, Ow, when I was in my late 20s and all the way through my 30s. Um, I'm going to quickly share with you a time in my life that brought me great angst, pain, sorrow, and confusion. In fact, it was so long ago that it almost feels like it wasn't even me, but it was. It all started with something I saw and read when I was about 26 years old, after I just had my son. I opened the medicine cabinet in the room, in the house that we were renting, and I had gone in the bedroom, in the bathroom and opened up the medicine cabinet, and inside the door was a sign that said, um, what to do guide. It was a what to do guide in case you have a heart attack. And here are the symptoms. As I said, I was in my late 20s at the time, and I kind of read over that sheet, and it said you would have pain down your left arm, 
jaw pain, nausea, heart palpitations, chest pains, you all know the symptoms of that. As innocent as that was, and little did I know that that would send me off into 10 years of intense fear. The fear of dying of a heart attack. I felt every pain in my body moving forward, in my chest, down my arm, and because of the anxiety that took over my mind that was telling me I was going to die of a heart attack, I began having palp palpitations every day of my life. Mind you, I lived this completely alone. I told no one, fighting my way through the extreme anxiety that would come out of nowhere. That was part of the major fear. I never knew when it was going to come, and that was fearful in itself. Once it hit, I would talk myself down, telling myself, I'm too young to have a heart attack. I'm too young. I'm in my late 20s. Telling myself to breathe and to breathe slowly and that it would pass. And I lived my life like that for 10 plus years. Until one day, sitting at my son's little league baseball game, I could feel it coming on. My hands got clammy, my feet got clammy. Lightheadedness, heart palpitations, jaw tightening, pain down my left arm, and I thought, here we go again. And I tried to talk myself down, but I couldn't do it this time. It just got more intense. Until after the game, I said to Doug, you got to get me to the hospital. And he was like, why? I said, because I think I'm having a heart attack. He said, a heart attack? Com caught him completely off guard. I said, just get me to the hospital. We hopped in the truck. He was going 100 miles an hour down the Crosstown freeway to get to the hospital where he landed in the parking lot of the emergency room and they came and got me out of the truck and I can remember for whatever reason so vividly saying, what is my blood pressure? What's my blood pressure? Why I was concerned about that, I have no idea, but I was locked in on that. And they said, your blood pressure's fine, you're fine, you're simply having an anxiety attack, a panic attack. And they did all the necessary tests and told me to go home that everything was fine. Once I got home, Doug and I had to have a conversation. I had to let him in on what in the world was going on with me. Because remember, I told you I lived it alone. He had no idea. He was stunned, confused, yet very comforting. He walked me through the ins and outs of what was happening. And now that I could relax and tell, told me I could now relax and move on with my life, as they told me in the hospital, your heart is strong. I then found myself in a cardiologist's office and sitting there, I remember thinking, what in the world, Vicki, are you doing in a cardiologist's office at the age of 30, 31 years old? Looking around at all the elderly people waiting there, and there I was. Years had gone by, I was still having anxiety attacks, still thinking I was going to die of a heart attack, and the doctor sent me to the cardiologist to again check my heart, and there I was looking around thinking, what in the world am I doing here? I had an echocardiogram done and sent home with a heart monitor that I eventually ripped off and said, this is nuts. This is crazy. The doctor explained to me that my heart was strong again, he did say, you do have mitral valve prolapse. It's a little valve that doesn't close all the way, but it's no big deal. It's very common. And you do have a little heart murmur. It's no big deal. That's very common. And as I walked out, he said, let me tell you something. You'll probably live to be 100 years old. Now to a 30-year-old year old person fearing that she was going to die of a heart attack. That sounded like music to my ears. So, all was well with Doug and I after visiting the cardiologist, but not really. I again started having doubts and fears started creeping in my mind. My mind started to think MVP, mitral valve prolapse. So what do I do? I get my medical books out. We didn't have the internet at that time. And I get my medical books out and I look up mitral valve prolapse and I started to research the things concerning that, and I found all the negative ramifications. I said, if you have a leaky mitral valve, it can cause your heart to be enlarged and cause a heart attack. And there I was again in the throes of intense fear. 
Now, I was not told mine was leaking, but the what ifs kicked in. But what if it does? When will it kick in? Will that again cause me to die of a heart attack? At that point, I began to let fear rule every part of my life. I became a very fearful person with everything. It was at the center of everything I did. Poor Doug, if we went out of town, I would tell him we have to stay close to a hospital just in case I need to get to a hospital. That's nuts. But it was so real in my mind that I knew I needed to be by a hospital to get to an emergency room quickly. I began to isolate myself even more than what I was already doing. I remember being asked by a group of moms to join them for a, a, a kid's fun play date at the park and I thought, I can't do that. What if I go and, and that anxiety kicks in and that fear kicks in and I kill over right there in front of all of them? How embarrassing would that be? I can't do that. So I began to isolate myself and do nothing. Ron had asked me back in 1987 when Doug came on staff here as an associate pastor to start a women's ministry. And so I did. In September of 1987, I started Bakersfield's women's ministry. And I'm happy to say this September, I'll be celebrating 35 years of leading a women's ministry. Hard to believe that 35 years has passed. But a couple years after I started it in 1987 here, I took all the women out to a retreat at Rio Bravo Resort outside of Bakersfield. Most of you know where that is. And after our first session, after I taught our first session, I remember I went back to my room and here it came again. I started having the intense clamminess pain down my left arm, jaw pain. I thought, here we go again. I'm going to go down right here at this retreat. Again, nobody knew. And I sat in my room and calmed myself down, talked myself down, did my breathing so that I could get ready to go out to teach session number two. And that's what I did. You see, the very thing I was fearful of was falling on me. The very thing that had gripped me of having a heart attack was actually falling on me. My fear was putting into motion a very real physical display of a heart attack and all the symptoms that go with it. My body was reacting to what my mind was saying was going on. That's the reality of our fears. I find it so interesting that Job in the Bible reminds us that before his disaster came into his life, he did not live a happy-go-lucky life. He was fearful. Job was a fearful man that trouble might come to him or to his family, so he took precautions before God to prevent it. We read in Job 1 through 5. I'm sorry, Job 1, 5. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. His children is what it's talking about here. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Job did this over and over. Why did Job do this continually? Because he was fearful of his children dying. Although Job was a God-fearing man, he had flaws. Fears in his closet that maybe nobody else knew about. Do you have something in your closet that nobody else knows about? He went out to make sacrificial atonements for his children, each and every one of them. Every time they partied, every time they partied and got drunk, he would go out and make sacrificial atonements out of fear, thinking that maybe if I make this sacrificial atonement that God won't take my children. And it says he did it over and over and over and over and over out of fear. 
While Job was in his prosperity, he was fearful that adversity might come. And he had dread of it. He dreaded it. He feared the loss of his family and all of his property. Job would move around his daily activities with these fears grounded deep within him. And oh, could I fellowship with that. I would move around in my daily activities and people would look at me and think I was normal, but I knew I was not normal. How I was living was not normal. And with Job, both of what he feared happened. What I feared was happening. After hearing the news and seeing the evidence of his great loss, Job broke down so grieved, so confused, and filled with so much pain and anger, just like most of us would have done, or even worse. The Bible says for days Job sat with his torn clothes, sackcloth, and in his aches, meaning deep pain and regret. For seven days, he sat with his friends in complete silence. Nobody said a word. The very next thing that came out of his mouth were these words. Job 3.25 Job finally begins to speak, and he says, What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. May I say to you this morning, be careful, very careful of what you fear. Because quite possibly, it could come to pass. If it's not taken control of, if it's not settled in your heart and in your mind, You see, I would try to hide it from Doug that I was struggling so that he would never know. I could tell he just simply didn't understand. And in fact, he would begin to get short with me, like, here we go again. Like, I don't get it, Vicki. It seems so real to you, and it seems so ridiculous to me. Until I remember him saying, I can see it in your eyes when you're struggling. Your eyes are like glazed over. And I know that it's a bad day for you. A new fear set in because it just evolved into another new fear, and that was the loss of losing my children. I had had four miscarriages, and fear set in that I was going to lose my daughter and my son, the two that I had. And so I began to keep them very close to me, always in eye shot. So I said no to everything to keep them close. Can we go to our neighbors and no? Can we go swimming? No. Can we do it? No. Because fear set in, I have to control the situation and make sure that you're okay. I even fought Doug. I didn't want them even riding bicycles. Can you imagine? We fought over buying them bicycles. I didn't want them riding bicycles out in our street for fear they'd get hit by a car. I saw my brother get hit by a car and fly 50 feet from where he was hit, and my father picking him up, limp in his arms, and putting him in an ambulance, and that had stuck in my mind. And so therefore, I thought possibly my kids would get hit by a car. And the fear continued on and on. I used to tease Doug because even as our kids got older and began to drive, I so wanted to be like my husband. He's such a fun guy. He doesn't really worry about anything. He's very even keeled. I'm very up, I'm very down, I'm very up, I'm very down. And I looked at him and I said, I want to be like you. You have so much fun. You enjoy every stage of your life and our kids' life. And I don't. Mine is riddled with fear that when they began to drive and they got their license, I can remember Doug standing in the driveway and waving to them saying, congratulations, good job, have fun. And there I was waving, saying, make sure your seatbelt's on. Drive the speed limit. Don't put people in your car. Do not listen to the radio. Complete opposite. Driven by fear that something would happen to them. 
My biggest regret in life is that I wasn't the fun parent, and I regret that. I was always the parent driven by fear, and my words to my children always reflected that. This went on for 10 plus years of my life, all the way through my 30s. I lost 10 years of my life to fear, which stands for false evidence appearing real. It was all a lie. False evidences appearing real is what fear is. It's a lie from the enemy. And one day, Doug spoke words of truth to me and said, enough's enough. He said, Vicki, if you play this out, all I know to tell you is if you die, you die. Oh, well, that's great. That makes me feel a lot better. If you die, you die. Play it out to the very end. Then you die. And that's not a bad thing. You go to be with the Lord in heaven. That's a good thing. And that made perfect sense. But then I began to think, if I die, you're going to remarry. Somebody else is going to raise my kids. And it never stops. It goes on and on and on. But I knew he was so right. He was right. I believed that, but I wasn't living that. After battling this for 10 years, I found myself completely exhausted, feeling like I was losing my ever-loving mind, losing the battle of my mind. I was losing it. I became manic. I became paranoid, and I would echo those words in my mind, if I die, I die, and I go to be with Jesus. That's not a bad thing. Romans 6, 8 says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Do I believe that? Yes. Yes. Life began to take a turn for me in my 40s. I stood up and I said, I'm ready to fight. I'm over this. I began to fight my fear with the word of God, the powerful word of God. I began to memorize scripture and speak it out loud over and over and over again. I memorized Romans 8.15. We'll put it on the screen for you. Romans 8.15, which said, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, bondage, that leads to fear again. You have not received that spirit, Vicki, but you've received a spirit of adoption. That as you're as a son and daughter of God, you can cry out, Abba, Father. That's the spirit you've received. And I would quote that over and over, and I still do to this day. Romans 8 and 6, I would quote, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Holy Spirit is life and peace. And I would speak it in my car, at work, wherever I was, whenever I felt that sense of fear starting to dwell up in me again. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for you have not given me a spirit of fear. God, you did not give me a spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind. So if you didn't give it to me, the stinking devil did. God makes it very clear saying, I did not give you this spirit of fear, addiction, depression. I didn't give that to you. Anger, unforgiveness. I didn't give that to you. What I gave you was a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. My victory came when I chose to stand up and fight my battle. 
to fight my battle with the word of God. Just like Jesus did in the wilderness against Satan himself. He fought Satan with the word of God and found victory in that. He didn't find it in anything else but quoting the word of God. Your victory will come when you stand up against the enemy and quote the word of God in his face. Then he will flee. I found myself getting spiritually stronger and stronger and stronger through the power of the Holy Spirit that was alive in me, that joined me and said, you ready to fight this? I'm ready to fight with you. I began to resist the devil. I began to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And you know what happened? Demons fled. They fled. I was finding my victory after losing 10 plus years of fear in my life. Fear was a stronghold and I was sick and tired of it ruining my life. Are you here this morning and are you sick and tired of something in your life ruining your life? Are you sick and tired of it? If you are, then this message is for you. There's a life of freedom to be lived, but you've got to fight for it. You've got to grab it in Jesus' name. You can do it. Let me tell you a few things about strongholds as we wrap this up. A stronghold is where one prevailing problem stalks your life. Mine was fear. It stalked me. Where does Satan have a hook in you today? Do you have one prevailing problem that you look at and you go, gosh, if I could just get rid of this one thing. Number one, every stronghold in the life of a believer is a tremendous source, get this, of pride for the enemy. He took great pride in knowing that he was kicking my fanny. Every stronghold in the life of a believer is a tremendous source of pride for the enemy. Let that make you mad and determined to stop giving the enemy satisfaction. The enemy hates God, hates God with all of his being. God is perfect and untouchable. But I'm here to tell you today, we are not. We are not untouchable. So what does the enemy do? He goes after us, God's children. What does the enemy want? He wants to hurt God by separating him from us. He wants to separate you from God because that would hurt God, and it does hurt God. And that's what the enemy is bent on doing. And he will do whatever it takes, whatever means to do it, whether it was through fear. I no more thought about God for 10 plus years than the man in the moon. I was so caught up in my stronghold of fear. I was just trying to survive. Whether it's fear Whether you sit here today caught up in an addiction. My husband was caught up in an addiction. And he fought and God set him free. Whether it's anger, you've got a temper like no one. Bitterness, depression, unforgiveness. A stronghold of apathy. You just really could care less about a lot of things of God. You're good where you're at. You don't need to go any farther. It's a stronghold in your life. Let me give you just a few things to do to fight your battle. If you're here today and you say, I'm going to fight, I'm sick and tired of the stronghold in my life. Number one, you need to recognize your captor. Know who he is, that he's a liar and a murderer. And the things he tells you are a lie. Recognize him. Recognize his schemes. What he will do to draw you back in. What he will do to take control of your life. Know his schemes. For each lie the enemy speaks to you, you have to put up the truth, the word of God. Stand in agreement with God. Stand in agreement with God when you fight your battles. Don't trade what you know for what you don't know. That's when you get in trouble. What do I mean by that? What, what do you know? By trading 
what you know for what you don't know. You know that God will never leave you. You know that. So don't cry out that I'm alone. Nobody cares about me. I'm all by myself. When you know that God says, I am always with you, I will never leave you. Don't trade what you know for what you don't know. Know that God is for you, he's not against you. So when you feel like the world is against you, don't trade that for what you know, that God is for you, he's not against you. When you fight like that, you'll win. Confess with your mouth as many times as you can that Jesus is Lord. Speak the word of God out loud. I do this to this day. I take my Bible and I walk through my house reading the Word of God when I do my devotion. I'll walk into my bedroom. I'll walk out of my bedroom. I walk into our bathroom. I walk out. I walk into our living room reading the Word of God because I want the Word of God to richly dwell in my home. Confess with your mouth. I just said that. Let the power of the word of God rule and reign in your home. Believe in your heart. This is simple. You're here this morning because you believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that he is who he says he is. Profess to believe in what you profess to believe in, and that will change your life. Number two, every stronghold is related to something that we have lifted up, exalted to a higher position than God in our life. It's very easy. You've simply lifted up that stronghold to a higher position than what God holds in your life. I held myself up as an idol. I was more concerned about me, 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 and my fears, and my anxiety, and my worries, and my frustrations. I was concerned about me, me, and I lifted myself up before God. That's what strongholds do. What are you exalting to a higher position than God in your life today? Number three, you will defeat your strongholds when you realize that winning a war involves fighting many battles. It does not, it's not easy. You can't be weak when you're fighting. You're fighting in a war. And it may mean fighting many battles to win the war. Scripture is filled with lots of examples and reminders that we need great determination. I hope and pray today that you walk out of here with great determination to say that I'm sick and tired of losing this battle. I think of Joshua, who defeated 31 kings all the way into the promised land with great determination. He faced battle after battle after battle. He knew that he had the victory, but there were battles along the way to get into the promised land, and he defeated 31 kings and finished his job. You keep fighting and victory will be at the end for you. Don't give up. Number four, the more entrenched your stronghold, the more entrenched the enemy is. The deeper you are in whatever you're involved in, the deeper the enemy is. 10 years of fear, the enemy was embedded deep. And it took some hard, great determination to get out. So know that how deep you in, you're in, the enemy's in just as deep. And that it's going to be a battle, but you can win that battle. Be ready for additional attacks. Because our adversary goes about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's his mission. He wants to devour you. He wants to ruin you and your life. Oh, he does it so subtly that sometimes we don't even notice. I've always told Doug I've caught on to the schemes of the enemy when I get irritated, annoyed, agitated. When I'm in line at the grocery store and I get an annoying spirit like, geez, Marie, how long is this line going to take? It says at three in a line, you start another register. I don't see anybody starting another register. And you know how that goes. And I get irritated and I thought, ah, 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 ah. That's the stinking enemy. That is a demon of irritation. 
It's a demon of annoyance. So just settle in, Vicki, and relax. You don't have anywhere to go. Just relax. And that has been life-changing to me. When Doug and I are just going about our day, and all of a sudden I get really irritated at him. He just bugs the heck out of me for no reason at all. I think, you know what, that's a demon wanting me to get annoyed and frustrated with him. The way he drinks his coffee, he slurps it, and that bugs me. <laughs> but I've learned to let that go. It's a demon wanting me to get irritated at that and tell him, quit slurping your coffee. But I've acknowledged that I know where that comes from. It comes from the enemy. So what do we do? We stay on guard. The Bible says we're always to be on guard, watching where the next attack is going to come from. And lastly, remove from your life the things that Satan uses to defeat you in your stronghold. No, she didn't just say that. Yes, it will take action on your part if you're serious about wanting to be set free from your stronghold. You will have to remove some things from your life. I know it's difficult, but how free do you want to be? Doug threw away all of my medical books, took them all, and I had a ton of them on everything. Because that's where I went. Whenever I felt like I had a headache, I had a brain tumor, I would look on brain tumors. I, I just saw a commercial with TED, with your eyes, uh, tired eye disease or, or thyroid eye disease. And her eyes were red and they were, they were sore, they were achy, and they were gritty. I said, I have that. I have that. So even to this day, the enemy is still trying to get me. He took and threw away every one of my medical books and said, we're done with this. You will no longer look and diagnose yourself. They all got thrown away. Is what I had to do to get my freedom. Now that we have Dr. Google, I don't allow myself to Google medical things anymore. Well, I'll just Google it and find out what it means. It always leads back to cancer and you're dying, always. And for a person like me, that's not good. So that has to go. I never, ever go to Dr. Google and Google anything. I know better. I know it's a trick of the enemy. I intentionally do not ask when somebody comes up and says, oh, I've been really sick or I just got out of the hospital with, with kidney stones or whatever. And my first response was, what were your symptoms? <laughs> and may I be transparent enough to tell you it wasn't because I really cared. That's pathetic, but it's true. It was because what, I want to know the symptoms in case it happens to me. What were your symptoms? How did you feel? How long did you have it? And I thought, oh my gosh, this has got to stop. So I will never ask anybody again, what were your symptoms? That's a trigger for me. I need to be smart. Now I ask, how are you feeling? You tell me and I pray for you. It's probably what I should have done in the first place. You may need to remove friends. Remove some of the friends in your life that the enemy will use as your enablers to your sin. You don't want to, I know. But you need to remove some of those friends that bring you down into sin. Get rid of them, thus saith the Lord. They're not coming up to your level. You're going down to their level. Remove phone numbers from your phone that get you connected to your drug dealer. Get rid of it. Make it difficult for you to make that call. I mean, we'll just get real. You keep that number in your phone and so it's easy when you get depressed or oppressed or mad or angry, you just push that number and off you go. Get rid of it. If you're truly determined, with great determination, to set yourself free. And then remove the internet if it draws you into sin. Well, I can't live without the internet. There's no way. Then you live in your sin. 
That's a big step, but God will honor that if you say, I need to step away from the internet. I need it off my phone. I need it out of my house so that this stronghold will be broken. Are you willing to do that? Strongholds can stop you in your tracks and hold you back. It's not easy to face your stronghold, and boy, do I know that. It's not easy to push through them, but it's essential if you're going to win your battle. I end with this. We have to always remember that it's God's power at work in us that will bring victory. It's nothing you're going to do. It's the power of God in you. You be obedient to him and do what he calls you to do and then let the power of the Holy Spirit set you free. John 8, 3, 6 says this. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And oh, how I know this to be personally true. I praise God that I've been free for almost 30 years from intense fear in all areas of my life. And God is no respecter of person. persons. What he's done for me, he can do for you. Get ready to fight and set yourself free. God bless you guys. How many of you, uh, kind of like me, when you go in for a medical procedure and you have to go under anesthesia, I don't sleep real well at night. Uh, so I got to just be honest, I love that feeling of when they hit you with that anesthesia. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You're, hey, it's a medical procedure. I'm not like it doing drugs. But just that thought, you get that nasty little taste in your mouth for a second, and then you just all of a sudden it's like you're out. I wish I could sleep like that every night, have that, that kind of peace. But it produces, I think why we like it so much, because it produces, you know, albeit just a couple seconds, this peace, this serenity, like, you know what, whatever, I'm just surrender myself to whatever procedure is going to happen. Just boom, I'm out. I believe it's that feeling of peace and serenity that makes illegal drugs so uh, enticing for some. It, although, you know, it's just a short little diversion and you got your problems are still there when you come out of it and they're oftentimes, you know, compounded because of your drug use. That's what people are looking for. I just need a break. I just want to escape just for a little bit. But there's a peace that God can give us. And it's described in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26, verse 3, I believe, out of the New Living Translation that says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. The key there, perfect peace to those whose thoughts are fixed on God. David came to a scene, the youngest brother of his brothers, fighting the Philistines, Israel against the Philistines. And the Philistines would march out each day, Goliath. Goliath was roughly nine foot tall. I believe quite possibly he was part of the Nephilim uh, that was in the book of Genesis chapter six there. Uh, many people, me being one of them, my interpretation is, is that the Nephilim were produced by demons having sex with women. So I think Goliath had some demon in him. And he would come out each day and say, hey, no need having, you know, this mass slaughter between us and you. Just bring out your guy. I'm our guy. And we'll fight. And then that'll determine which which country is going to have this land here? And he would come out each day and taunt them. And Israel would just, just be dismayed. And it says that they were just so fearful. Why? Because they saw this nine-foot guy with all this armor on. And they were terrified. Because why? Their eyes were on their problem. Their eyes were on their enemy. And here comes young David, maybe 15, 16 years old at this time. And David comes up there and he witnesses this scene. He sees his brothers and Israel just running, uh, cowering to this uh, giant. And David says, what in the world are you doing? He says, you're going to let this uncircumcised Gentile taunt the armies of the living God? 
nobody's going to fight him. He goes, I'll fight that sucker. And he went out there and fought him. You say, what, if, what was it about David? Why was David not intimidated? And these other soldiers who were obviously mighty, and there were some good, good soldiers, how come they were fearful? Well, it all came down to whose eyes were on who. See, David had been out in the wilderness shepherding, and it says that David told the giant, he says, you know what, I've killed a lion, and I've killed a bear. And you know what, sucker? You're not as fast, and you're a lot bigger, easier to hit, so you're going to go down just like they are. Why? Because David had seen God move, and David's eyes were on God, on the living God, not on his problem. Now, that's the word for some of you here today. Vicki found victory when she began to look to God. First of all, she said, I'm sick of this. I'm ready to fight. And then she began to look to God, and she discovered the power there that she didn't have before. For some of you, it ends today. It ends today. Will you fight today? How long will you continue to be intimidated by your Goliath? Are you going to stand up? Are you going to say, I will not succumb to this addiction. I will not give in to this fear. I refuse to be depressed anymore. I'm going to fight against this anxiety. Today is the day that I make my stand. You have an opportunity today. This could be a turning point. It's at the outset of my message. This could be a turning point for your life if you'll choose to fight. So here's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask for you to be very humble. The Bible says that he is, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives lots of grace to the humble. I'm going to give you an opportunity to be prayed for, but I'm going to have you stand. I'm going to have you stand in humility, stand in, in, in openness uh, that God would move. So right now, Father, I just pray, Lord, for those that are here, those that, that this message has just hit right home with them, those whose minds are, are, are a runaway train at times, those who are saying, I need to fight. I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of being anxious. I'm tired of being fearful. I'm tired of being tempted. I'm tired of just, I'm, I'm just tired, tired, tired. I'm sick of this. I want to live differently. God, right now, just move upon their hearts and let them just have the desire to fight today. So you that are ready, yes, there's already people standing. My gosh, there's already people standing. You stand. You stand if you're ready. Today you stand. I'm going to say a prayer over you. I'm going to say, say a prayer of authority. I'm going to say a prayer uh, that the Holy Spirit's going to come. Go, you stand. Don't miss out on this. Don't miss out on this. This, this, is a, this is a holy moment for some of you. This is an opportunity for you to have the rest of your life take a different course. Don't miss out on this today. Okay. I want you that are standing, I want you to do something just symbolically. I just want you just to cup your hands. Just cup your hands as if you're receiving something. Father, right now, God, I pray for everyone that is standing here, everyone that has their hands cupped, Lord. Right now, first of all, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over demon spirits, over every demon that has, has uh, accessed these people's lives, every demon who would try to claim control of their mind. In the name of Jesus Christ, Satan and demons, you take your hands off these people. You take your hand. These are God's people right now. In the name of Jesus, you take your hand off them. If, if you're not right with the Lord right now, as you're standing, just say, God, I give you my life again. I give you my life. I give you my life. I commit my life to you. Just talk with God as I'm praying. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan and demons, you, your power is broken over them. And God, right now, I pray, fill them with the Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit, come. Start on this side, Holy Spirit, and just come. Just begin to fill. Begin to come and fill. Fill, 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 fill them. New power, new power, new power, new resolve, new fight. Put fight in them, God. Put fight in them, God. Let them just say, I will not live the way that I've been living. God, put fight in right now. Come, Holy Spirit, and just fill them right now. And God, let them begin to, to, to seek out two or three verses that they can stand upon right now. And God, I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe, God, that today freedom has come to these people. Freedom has come to these people, God. Let, this, let them know this just begins the fight. This doesn't end it. This just begins it. They're, they're entering the fight. But greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. That's our proclamation today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Would the rest of you stand? I want to pray just a prayer over everybody here. Everybody stand if you would. Father, I pray your blessing upon these precious people. I pray you bless their going out. I pray you bless their coming in. 
I pray you bless their marriages. I pray you bless their finances, God. I pray you bless their health, God, that they'd have the blessing of God upon them. That's my prayer for them today. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys, we hope you got something out of that message. Feel free to visit our website at vvf.org to watch our latest sermons. Follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon.